ancient decrepit minibus from the school, so we're all very much shaken, <laughs> but glad to have arrived safely. Uh, and thank you very much for asking us to come up from the school. So yeah, we're from Campbelltown Grammar School, which is in South Kintyre, and the project uh, was done alongside Kilmartin House Museum. So we've got Ju Julia Martin here, Julia Hamilton rather in the centre, and uh, Julia approached me from the school, from the school um, maybe last June, I believe, and the project took several months to develop, and over the last year, we've uh, rerun with the project. Okay, so Glen Ray is in South Kintyre, it's near South End, the very South End of the peninsula. So the planning then started last June, um, and we were really lucky that Julia invited us to, to take part in the project. She's had successful projects in South Kintyre with other schools, but mainly from the primary school, I believe, running a project uh, in the previous year on a, an Iron Age done. So we were very excited to be asked to be involved. Uh, Julia took care of the funding for us. Without the funding, this couldn't have taken place. Um, the funding paid for sessions with professional craftspeople, professional filmmakers, professional sound recordist, recordists. So this was essential. Without Julia's involvement, we couldn't have done the project. Um, selecting the group, that was over to me, and that was very, very important. I work in the Learning Support Centre at Campbelltown Grammar School with children with a range of learning difficulties, uh, special needs like autism, um, ADHD, behavioural difficulties. And we're very keen that the project was not just about people with learning difficulties, we wanted to make it a broader project. So we asked the Student Council, and we have a representative of the Student Council here, and they were also able to join as student buddies so we had people from Main Street and from the Learning Support Centre working together, along with old people like me, <laughs> and some of my colleagues, we've got Agnes Stewart here, Jimmy McCallum, and Kareen Cox. So there's quite a group of us in the end of mixed ages and mixed, mixed abilities. Um, and we developed a programme which was to give the children a really rich experience so they could engage with their past. And that would range from finding out about history, looking at historical documents, um, craft to engage with material culture, actually visiting the site, taking part in ar archaeological recording and surveying, um, filmmaking, singing, and sound recording. So a very rich task in the kind of parlance we use in curriculum for excellence these days. So it ticked all the boxes, and that's why my boss let me do it, which is very important. Okay, so day one of the programme, we had Philip Price, a professional wildlife um, filmmaker. He came and ran a session with the young people, learning how to use their iPads properly. The young people are very familiar with iPads and how to use them for filming, but the product's often not that good. So he showed them how to do it properly, how to frame their pictures, how to use um, guiding features, um, so you can see them practicing here, just how to frame a picture properly, how to give them a handlebar features for thick pictures. So they were excellent, and that was a really rich day, and provided a lot of material, which Muggins here had to go home and edit. <laughs> so that was a lot of downloading for me. I think we had something like 10 iPads, and maybe half a dozen cameras. So you can imagine with a bunch of teenagers, how much material that developed. But it was very, very rich. Okay, second part of day one was visiting Campbelltown Museum. And I should say that Campbelltown Museum is managed by Kilmartin Museum, but Elaine Chesney is the curator there. And she did a really, really good session for the young people, handling and photographing the kind of artefacts which may be typical from a, a township such as Glen Ray. And we have an example here of Cragenware. Uh, which was a, a kind of pottery which was locally produced in the uh, township uh, by the people there. There's a theory that the Cragenware was made to sell to, to local visitors. Um, I think it's more common in some of the coastal areas where it was probably sold to day visitors that came in on the steamers. But used from local stream and river clay. So they actually got to handle and photograph these art artefacts. Things which are otherwise locked away in a museum, they don't really get to see. 
Right, day two is actually going to Glenray. And this is a bit about the actual um, place itself. So it's in a beautiful environment in South Kintyre. Um, and we carefully picked this site for a number of reasons. I, I was familiar with the site anyway. I knew there was a, a former township there which had been deserted and there was outstanding archaeology to go and see. It's also a popular destination in the springtime because of daffodils and you can see some here. At the time there were loads and loads of daffodils so it was a really lovely environment to work in. Um, and also when you look on um, Canmore, the, the system that we have, there's very, very little recorded for the site, so there was a big gap to fill. I think you just mentioned there is a township that was really hit. There was very little information. So anything the young people could bring to it from the project was going to help the wider knowledge. And lastly, most importantly for their engagement, it actually has a traditional folk song, the Thatcher of Glen Ray. So it's a bit of a fun song that we thought could really frame the work that we're going to do. So the first day, they were really busy looking at filming and photography, so recording the place through film and through photography, and also doing a, a flora and fauna survey. They were also looking at recording the architecture that they could see, and it was an absolutely brilliant day. You can see the weather was very kind, but we've had some really, really good results from it. So from Canmore being empty, we were able to find a lot of the, the field dikes, we were able to find the kale garden, we were able to locate two of the bridges and a road running through. Um, and these were sort of post medieval bridges, so quite unusual. We were also able to find the corn drying kiln at the head of dike of the township, something which the archaeologist Roddy Regan, who was with us, said was quite unusual for the area. So we were really, really pleased. So this was the young people's first experience of <coughs> practical archaeology and they were already adding to the archaeological records. So it's quite a powerful learning experience for them. And for me, I should say. Um, day three then, they'd seen Glen Ray as it is now as a, as a ruin. By day three, they went to Ockendray Museum to see a township as it would have been in its heyday. And that was a thoroughly exciting experience for them. Again, thanks to Julia for organising it. They were very lucky to be able to make pancakes on an open fire. Um, that had a demonstration from some of the workers there. Touring the building, seeing the crook house construction, seeing rash roofing, as would have been used at places like Glen Ray. Trying out the beds, not very comfortable. <laughs> I think the people at Glen Ray must have been a shorter kind of stuck. But that was a great experience for framing what they'd seen as a ruin, um, as it would have been in the heyday of the site. So day four, that was a very, very practical session back in the classroom. And you remember I said about the song, The Thatcher of Glen Ray. We decided to make the thatching and the weaving rashes very much the focus of some of the craft work. So Julia invited Pip Weezer, a local craftsperson along to help run this session and they're able to make cordage from rashes that were found in the fields. They're able to help weave a, a rush mat. That was, it, was, it was great because these are where we live, just something that's seen as a, a hassle more than anything. Something that farmers spend a lot of time spraying, draining and topping to get rid of. But actually it was a very productive thing in the past. We're lucky to have Elizabeth Marison from the Kintyre Antiquarian Society along, and she helped us look at census records for Glen Ray. So we're able to see the development of the site from the early 19th century. Um, well, it was already well established by then, obviously, but we're able to see how the population changed. And in the 19th century, there were two um, parts to this township, so a joint tenancy, if you like and we're able to see that uh, over time through to the end of the 19th century, the population dwindling, one of the tenants is going by the way. And that tied in with some of the finds we had from the site, which suggested that one of these sections of the township had just been used as a sheep fangs later on. So what had formerly been a dwelling house for one of these shared tenancies was later turned over just for uh, agricultural use. So that was very, very powerful for them, seeing how this went from a thriving township 
through the census records to somewhere that was deserted. We also had Roddy Reagan there, the uh, archaeologist from Kilmarty, to show the young people how to record artefacts properly. So looking at real pottery, trying to piece together the pottery, he had some great bins of finds for them to look through. So really be good for them to handle real material. You can see here, yeah, I suppose it's like a corn dolly, isn't it, that they've made. But that's from the rashes that you see above. And then day five, very, very much a craft focus again. This is them having had a go at making a crag and wear. So I think typically they were trying to sell little teacups and saucers. And in Campbelltown Museum, there's a very nice example of one of these little teacups that was found in Campbelltown. So they all had a go at making those. So in Campbelltown Museum, if you wish to go and see, there's an exhibit with all the young people's work there. Uh, loads and loads of this crag and wear reproduction pottery and if i may say so it's as good as the original stuff because the original <laughs> stuff is pretty pretty rough looking um, there's another of the pots that they made and they really enjoyed doing this i think the idea of that was maybe a little grain storage bin that was what was in the young person's head so that's great and even more powerfully they made these models so what did they what does glen ray look like now and uh, julia uh, worked really hard with them and they were able to reconstruct the landscape using plaster and uh, make this model. It's not come out too well, but that's how it is now, which is transferable by this model of how they think it would have been in its heyday, completely rash roof. So that was all clay work they did really, really well with. And again, that's in Campbelltown Museum. It's well worth seeing. Uh, day six, this was the culmination of the project. So this was about them singing the Thatcher of Glen Ray song, all about a guy who came from Bally Castle, went up to Glen Ray to help thatch the place, had a really terrible experience, and ends the song saying he would come back to Kintyre, but never to Glen Ray. <laughs> so <laughs> we certainly didn't feel like that, but we weren't thatching it. Um, we had a professional recording artist, um, Steve Burr, I think he's from the band The Linky, is that right? So he's quite well known in in uh, musical circles and that song is something that we're going to show you in a minute and the young people had a great time singing that and I think for weeks afterwards we were all humming it Connie you're now one of our pupils there as soon as it had gone from my mind he stuck it back in my mind again <laughs> <laughs> so it stuck with me all through the summer holidays <laughs> okay then we had a big open day so this brought together all their work at Campbelltown Museum and here are some of the young people and one of the old ones in the back. Uh, we did that in June, and we launched our display of all the artifacts that we'd made, and all photographs that we'd taken. Um, the video that we had is now in an audio-visual display there, so that's a new thing for Campbelltown Museum. Never had an audio-visual display before, so it's come right up to the 20th century. Not sure about the 21st, but it's, it's getting there, so we're really, really pleased with that, and it's had a lot of really positive feedback. We invited the local press in, the pupils, students, staff and guests. So, uh, you know, got quite a lot of coverage locally. I think that's helped people have a greater appreciation for the, the archaeology around them. Right, last thoughts then. So I've already said thank you a few times to Julia Hamilton and some of the staff. So they were, they were great from Kilmarty Museum. But it raises some thoughts about where we go in the future. And we think there's a lot of opportunities for collaboration between schools and heritage organisations, be they museums or archaeological bodies. It would be great to see more of that. I think too much archaeology is seen as uh, an elitist kind of experience. It's not something which your uh, run-of-the-mill students, run-of-the-mill people are able to engage with very fully, which is why it's great to hear about the community archaeology projects which you've been talking about. But all too often, even in those young people, I'm not excluded, but they're not really engaged with very effectively. This was a way of doing that, because these are our lifeblood for the future of our heritage. Um, next year, we're hoping to help on an excavation up at Carnassian Castle, which is near Kilmartin. So we're really hoping that will come through. It all depends on funding, I think. But uh, Julia and Roddy are busy doing that at the minute. But in terms of how to do this, the kind of 
model that we have there of a rich task means it fits in very well with the curriculum for excellence. It ticks all the, the headlines that teachers and head teachers are looking for to get funding. And most importantly for us in our, our department is widening those opportunities for people with additional support needs. So how can we get them involved as well? Because the past also belongs to people with additional support needs and special needs. It's not just an intellectual activity. People who maybe have those challenges are also able to engage with physical challenges too. They should also be encouraged to engage. And this is a brilliant project for that. Right, I think that's enough of me talking. Uh, I think we've got a film just now. If you're from here, this is quite a comfortable atmosphere. If you come from far away, they probably will immediately interpret this as quite a wild idea, quite a wild place to be. It's the sound of the wind, there's occasionally a few birds off in the trees. I thought I heard a pheasant a few, um, a few minutes ago. These trees have only been here for 90 odd years, so they would have probably had smaller trees which are more useful for birds to live in. They certainly would have heard the noise of the sheep, the sound of the cattle. The, uh, the sheep and cat, the sheep would have been kept fairly close to the, to the houses, the cattle would have probably been kept slightly further away. We are just looking at the area um, and deciding exactly what's here, what might have been here. The um, archaeology group, the photography group, and the wildlife history group um, and each of the three groups are alternating so I'm currently in the photography group but next time I'm going to be moving to the natural wildlife group and I've already done the archaeology Hi, so how old do you think this site is, when was the first known recordings of this site? As far as we're aware, uh, Glen Ray, we've got documents that date the site. The first na the time the name comes up is in the 15th century. But I think it's 1451, but I'll, I need to check that because I haven't got the documents with me. Mm. But that makes the site, you know, it's old, it's older than 500 years. I suspect it's, it's because it's in those documents, it's older than that. Because it used to belong to the Duke of Argyle all the way through, and then it was, it was farmed out as a tenant farm, yeah. Oh. How big were the families of the people who lived here? Difficult to know over the piece. We know that we know that we know from records and we can see from the remains there's, there's two sets of buildings. There's, there's, there's the buildings that run kind of this way, and then there's another set of buildings that go from that way. And we know that what we call two tenancies. So there was two families or two tenant farmer families here. And as far as I'm aware, I think in the census records, but again I'll have to go back and look at that. We know. The highest numbers ever got here was, I think, over 30 people were living here. So it's quite a lot of people. So there would have been several families. Families might have been bigger in those days, but from the census records, when you guys go back and look at them, you'll be able to figure out and, and put the names of the people who lived here. We think we know that there was McNaughton's living here. We know there was McNeil's living here. We know there was some Campbell's living here uh, from the census records. And what was this mainly used for? This. Area. The settlement is, is kind of it's typical of of what we an Argyle or Kintyre settlement. It's a, it's a joint tenancy farm, uh, and they would have it would have just been an agricultural farm, which they would have had. They would have grown, I'd imagine, barley, oats, the, the, and the fields that are surrounding here, which you'll, you'll get in the film. Uh, they, they may have had some cattle. They may have even had some sheep and goats. Uh, so it would have been a kind of typical farm, quite a small one. I mean, it's only two tenancies here. A lot of townships go up to six or seven families living in one area, but this one was 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 occupied until at least you know the, the early early 20th century. So it's a long history from 1450 to the early 20th century. So when we're talking about the end of this, the occupiers who lived here, 
When was the last recorded um, point that people were here? We know from census records that there's a family, one family still here in 1901, in the 1901 census. Censuses happen every 10 yeah. years. So On every 19, year that yeah, ends with yeah, a Yeah, and then, yeah, and yeah. every year ends with a one. But by 1911, this doesn't get mentioned in the census. So, so between 1901 and 1911, this place becomes abandoned. It's no longer used. As, as, a, as, as a tenant's farm. Now when I cross over the mountain, say hi, I'm Antonio Mandy, I'm Tony Zai, to see a stranger who brought me this way, I was sent by Big Jamie to Apache Pendry. Fashioned uh, plates and spoons. And I'm looking at this board uh, originally. I'm looking at how beautiful it looks. And the rest of this looks beautiful as well. We use those rules of composition to make it very uncluttered, make it very clean, focus on the patterns. Yeah. I think they like spinach. 